hard map. There we go. As many of you know, OLLI at BCC is one of 124 OLLIs located around the country in all 50 states, providing vibrant educational, social, and volunteer opportunities designed especially by and for people 50 years and better. Over the past year, we moved all of our programming online and actually doubled the number of programs we offer to ensure that our OLLI com community stayed connected and engaged during these challenging times. While we look forward to meeting again in person as soon as it is safe, we're also excited to continue to offer online talks, classes, tours, and more. Today's program, like most of Ollie's programs, was developed by Ollie members, specifically members of our Changing Ageism Shared Interest Group. And you can see two of them here with me today, Catherine Kidd and Mary Jane Matina. Catherine Kidd will moderate your questions and Mary Jane is going to introduce our speaker. Today is the last of four online programs that have featured age-friendly health systems, health inequities among older adults, and Dr. Louise Aronson, the author of the New York Times bestseller, Elderhood. All of these were recorded and are available on Ali at BCC's YouTube, YouTube page, free of charge to watch whenever you'd like, and all were in partnership with Age-Friendly Berkshires and the Berkshire Supergenarians. In addition, today's talk is in partnership with another OLLI member group, the Tech Impact Forum, and their partners, One Berkshire and the Berkshire Innovation Center. Thank you to all of our partners. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Mary Jane Matina, as I said, a member of OLLI's Changing Ageism Shared Interest Group and a co-founder of the Berkshire Supergenarians, who will introduce today's wonderful speaker, Professor Joe Coughlin. Mary Jane? Both me and, and making a few thank yous here uh, to all the other members of the uh, shared interest group who have worked together for almost two years now on talking about aging and, and how it impacts us. Brian, uh, Kate, uh, Patty, Fran, Laura, and Megan. And thank you also to the sponsors of Berkshire Supergenarians who have helped us um, over the past couple of years as well. We bank. Greylock Federal Credit Union, October Mountain Financial, and the Robert C. and Tina Son Foundation. And I want to say a special thank you to Dr. Alice Bonner, who was um, who served as the head of the Executive Office of Elder Affairs for Governor Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, and is now at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement because she provided the original email introduction of me to Dr. Coughlin, and I'm very appreciative of that. Dr. Joseph Coughlin hails from upstate New York, very upstate New York, um, an area that he describes as so rural and with such a low population density that it makes our Berkshire County look something like the sixth borough of New York City. He received his PhD from Boston University, but it's interesting in going over his career, how his work has spanned academia, government, as well as private industry. Um, in, in the government sector, he was appointed by President George W. Bush to the White House Advisory Committee on Aging and by Governor Charlie Baker here in Massachusetts to the Governor's Council on Aging in Massachusetts. There he served as the co-chair of the Innovation and Technology Subcommittee. He's worked in private industry, serving on advisory boards for Bell Canada, British Telecom, Fidelity Investments, and others. Since 1999, he has been the founder and the director of the MIT, that would be Massachusetts Institute of Technology Age Lab, and his academic research deals with the impact of global demographic change and technology trends on consumer behavior and business strategy. He's also the author of the 2017 book, The Longevity Economy. And most recently, he has partnered with the Boston Globe to create the Longevity Hub headquartered in Boston, but with spokes throughout New England. It is a delight to have Joe here today to talk about the new future of old age in today's longevity economy. Joe, the screen is yours. Great, Mary Jane, thank you very much for having me and thank everyone in the audience and throughout the Ali community for inviting me. This is a real delight. I'm amazed at the number of people that I see participating from all over the country and indeed some around the world all of you are in my basement. I never knew I could fill that much, uh, many people in such a small space. 
So I'm going to do a quick technology shift here, and we will get the story going here. So one second. See, you can never put a, have too many gadgets in your life. So once again, I want to thank everyone for having me. So for the next few minutes, I want to tell some stories and some give some ideas as to how the future of old age, which if you think about it, is the only group of people, the only class, if you will, that all of us really aspire to, because between you and I, the alternative is not nearly as pretty. So I want to talk about the future of old age and how there's, there's this convergence of new behaviors, attitudes, and indeed, yes, technology is part of that. I want to thank for the introduction of, uh, from the Berkshires, and yes, my family from very far upstate New York, as I like to say, but I'm also a BU grad, but I'm also a proud grad of the State University of New York at Oswego. That kind of gives you an idea of uh, where a lot of my heart and my friends and family are from, if you will. But today, let's talk about the longevity economy. For those of you who can't sleep, there's my book that was mentioned, but also if you're one of those folks that find themselves on Twitter or uh, LinkedIn, I have articles on LinkedIn, Forbes, variety of places. So as I said, if you can't sleep, it's a great place to find me, follow me, and share a few comments, even comments I don't like. Those are often the most fun. So let me start with a story, and stories are important, as you will find out. This is an image of Sarah Noss. I don't know how many of you recall this woman. In 1999, she made great news. She turned 119 years old. But here's the thing. On her 119th birthday, someone, a journalist, had the profound, the only way to put it, profound chutzpah to ask her, Ms. Noss, why do you enjoy living so long? She came back with an answer, far better than any pundit, policymaker, researcher, engineer, doctor, whatever it might be. She said, I enjoy my longer life because I have my health and I can do things. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the two bookends of the longevity economy. Yes, it's about health. It's not all about health, but it's about health and the ability to do things. There is an amazing difference between being ill and being sick. And we'll come back to that. You may think I'm playing a word game, but if we think about it a little bit more, it's more than that. So Sarah Noss inspired me and others to start the MIT Age Lab, where we weren't focused on whether or not you should you know, eat this that, or not eat that, or how much you exercise, or did you choose your parents wisely? No, we're not into that. We want to think about what are the things you will be doing over a lifetime? How will the physical environment reflect and reinforce the things that you want to do? That's what we want to focus on today. So the Age Lab, to give you an idea, is based in the School of Engineering, but we're not all tech. We are one part social science and behavioral science, one part technology, and indeed one part innovation. We span working entirely with industry and government because we don't want to just have things in the laboratory. I want everyone to help us get things out of the laboratory and into the living room. That's about changing lives. That's truly what we mean by the longevity economy and truly mean by research in service of humanity. So this is my team. If you like what I have to say, please give them credit. If you don't like what I have to say, blame me. And by the way, keep it to yourself. My team is one third, if you will, every flavor of psychology, if you will. Another third is social sciences and whatnot, engineering and data sciences, and also a group there, anthropology, social work, and the like. So we've got a very different team of students and researchers and faculty that we work with across MIT and affiliates around the world. So we have a lot of fun, but our fun is really about creating a new life tomorrow. And at the end of the day, that's our tagline. At the end of the day, aging is not about being old, so to speak. It's another day of life tomorrow, which, as I said, is far better than the alternative. By the way, you'll see this crowd. This photo is now a little dated now that we've been off campus for more than a year. Uh, but that is Miss Daisy. That's where the lab started. My original background, transportation, which we'll come to in a bit. But transportation, the idea of anything you do, you got to get there first. So Miss Daisy is a multi-million dollar, if you will, video game, if you will, that looks at everything from medication, health conditions, and new technologies, and its impact on how drivers behave behind the wheel. 
the areas that we study, there are others, but the four core areas to give you an idea of what the Age Lab does is transportation and livable communities. So it's about the vehicle, it's about walking, it's about how our communities are structured and, and managed, if you will, to facilitate accessibility and the density and the intensity that make life exciting and delighting and worth living there. How about the future of the home? We have programs where we're looking not just at the future of the house as being a place to live, but rather a platform of services that provide the care, the connectivity, and the convenience for people across the age lifespan and caregiving. And I'm going to be asking all of you uh, in a bit for a bit of a favor. There is no free lunch nor free talk. So I'm going to be asking you a little bit to help us out with our research. But our work on caregiving, are you a family caregiver, a friend that helps out? And many of us don't even realize that we're caregivers. We just think we're good spouses, partners, sisters, brothers, adult children, whatever that might be. But you'd be surprised what is caregiving. And then longevity planning, not retirement planning in the classic sense, where we make sure that we have enough money to be on a golf course, if that's a place you want to be, but truly longevity planning. How do we think about all those big and little things, even if you have the money that you may not have put into place just yet to live longer, better in older age? Let me give you a little tour of some of the things that we do at the Age Lab. This is inside the cockpit of one of our uh, previous cars called the Aware Car. I want you to imagine a car, but also your home, your workplace and the like, that will have sensors to be able to detect, are you stressed? Are you paying attention? What's your pulse rate? How are you feeling? And then have the vehicle or the environment that you're in change its performance based upon how you feel. You know, one of the favorite topics of the media is always about the issue of older drivers. That's what got me into aging. One of the things you should know is that birthdays alone do not kill. Health conditions do. So imagine an environment like your vehicle being able to detect how well you are, how distracted you are, whatever that performance might be behind the wheel. We also, and we'll talk about why this uh, student is dressed up the way she is, also study public transportation. By the way, public transportation, not just subways and buses in urban areas, but what are the volunteer networks? What are the faith-based institutions, the aging uh, network out there? How are their transportation alternatives providing mobility for all of us that need to do far more than simply getting to the doctor and the grocery store? Life in between is really where we want to go. And yes, we like to break things at the MIT Age Lab. So we have a fleet of vehicles, but we also do studies on how long does it take people to learn to use new technology, to trust them and to adopt that new technology. Think about how the car has changed amazingly over the last decade, let alone over the five, six decades going past. You almost need a computer science degree to work on your car and at least a computer science course to be able to operate your car. We're trying to understand how does that change how we drive at a young age, all the way to young, older age as well. And yes, this is Miss Rosie, another one of our vehicles on the road. And I will describe that suit in a moment. In fact, I'll do it now. The suit that you're looking at is Agnes. It stands for the Age Gain Now Empathy System. It allows our students, our researchers, the industry uh, uh, sponsors that we work with to show us saying, have the joys, if you will, of, uh, of having one, two, maybe three chronic conditions from arthritis, type two diabetes, unbridled, low vision and the like. So if you look at the suit, you'll see that there are straps and belts and goggles, whatnot, that restrict the movement, they, that uh, show the, the weakening of muscle, the diminishing of, of vision and whatnot. We've calibrated this with standards with colleagues at Mass General Hospital and the like. So we can take a 22 year old and give them a brief insight, at least into the physical parts of what aging might be like to open a bottle, to, to navigate shopping, to get in and out of a vehicle and the like. And no, this is no substitute for asking older adults or watching older adults or having them participate in the research. We absolutely do all of that as well. But Agnes gives you an aha moment that a survey, a video, an interview does not give you. You see, as many of you may know or may admit, as we age, I'll tell you a secret, we lie. And what I mean by that is, as we age, we cope pretty well. We start to say that bottle is hard to open because, well, I've got arthritic hands and, you know, geez, you know, what are you going to do? That's part of aging. But you know, an engineer, someone who knows how to structure something, as they open that bottle in the Agnes suit with the gloves on and they get soaking wet, 
They're going to say that's not acceptable. In fact, they know the technology, the design to make that different and to change. So while we can get some of that information, if you will, from older adults, quite often it's that aha moment. So you have to do mixed methods. You have to go out and watch. Sounds a little creepy, doesn't it? You have to ask surveys, interviews, on the spot uh, interviews, if you will. But you also have to have uh, empathy, if you will, to be able to understand what are the things that we can do, the aha moment, to feel the friction, the fatigue, and often the frustration of a built environment that more often than that is built for a 27 year old, five foot nine, 165 pound male. That's not a world that the majority of us fit into. And Agnes has done a lot of cool things. Agnes has not only been uh, uh, instrumental in redesigning, getting in and out of vehicles, packaging for food products, but with CVS, for instance, we help them redesign some of their newer stores. So some of the new stores you might see out there have lower shelving, better lighting, high contrast signage that you can see right in front of you. In fact, the signage is actually designed around the problem to be solved, such as stomach indigestion, rather than saying the product that's being sold, if you will. So if you start thinking about how we've actually used the uh, suit, it's more than research. We at the Age Lab want to put ideas into motion, not just collect insights and publish them overall. So the idea, you'll see some of our work in many different places. We also see the future of the home as being a platform for services. All those smart devices, the Internet of Things, as they call it, when the toasters and refrigerators become talking to each other are somehow now being connected, if you will, to the sharing economy. Many of us have access, some still do not. But during the pandemic, we saw the pandemic propel new technology and home services into the lives and living rooms of people probably five to seven or more years faster than we ever could have imagined. And the interface is no longer a keypad. It's no longer a touchscreen. Increasingly, it's your voice. But we're seeing all of these converge together under the leadership of one of my colleagues, Dr. Chai Wu Li, on a project called the C3 Home Logistics, where we're envisioning with companies around the world how to envision the home as a platform for services that provide connectivity in youth, provide convenience in middle age, and ultimately bring those two characteristics and care to those that may be aging in place or providing care to loved ones. Some of the devices being developed by my team include this little device. This is not meant to be on your shelf. This is very much a prototype, still very rough. But my team has been able to collect information from various homes to be able to model. What was your activity today? How often did you go to the refrigerator? How often did you go to the bathroom? As I said, this is somewhere between cool and creepy. But the smart home of the future will be able to monitor, manage, and motivate any behavior we want across the lifespan. The question will be, how much will it cost? Do we want to give up that privacy? And frankly, do we want a creepy system in the house? All of those things are part of our research agenda with industry and with all of you. We're also looking at rural aging as well. In fact, one of the last things we did in 2019 was to uh, convene with Tivity Health, a rural aging summit that was quite powerful. In fact, if you look at the photo carefully, you'll see that one of the stars of the program was Katie Couric, who was kind enough to lend her voice and gravitas, if you will, to the issues around rural aging. Where we live is as important as our health and our wealth and how well we live in older age. So being connected, fighting social isolation, having access to technology, services and health were among the things we spoke about at this particular conference. And we're continuing that mo momentum going forward with many partners. And we also work across the generations. Omega is an organization that where we recruit high school students from across the country to come up with ideas that will strike intergenerational bonds with older adults in their areas. We offer scholarships to those students who want to work with us even virtually. And we even give a gift to the school that they're from, to the winners, to make sure that their ideas that they come up with in their junior, senior years live on and we change the communities through the innovation and the fun that the students have and the engagement that they have with older adults there. Here's part of my ask. As I said, there's no free lunch and there's no free talks. 
I'm going to ask any of you that are 85 and older to please join the MIT Age Labs 85 plus lifestyle leaders. We have a group now from across the country that are 85 to 100 that work with us on a monthly basis, informing our ideas around new products, new services, listening to students, giving advice to students, some telling us some ideas are good and some ideas are just crazy, outrageous, stupid. These are folks that we really learn from great deal. We're looking for folks that will give us their insight and give of their time and have some fun. In many cases, when we were on campus, a lot of them were from the Boston area. While Zoom has not been the greatest medium in the world for high tech and high touch, it has allowed us to recruit people from Maryland, Massachusetts, California, and the like. So please sign up, send an email to agelabinfo at mit.edu. Tell me you want to join 85 plus. There is an age restriction, leaders, and we'll get you on board. Some of the other things you may not have seen or known came from the lab that were inspired. One of our former students, Cedric Hutchins, started the company Withings. Smart devices need not look like old man walking or about to fall down. They can be cool. They can be stylish. In fact, one of the things I want you to think about is that an age-ready, not age-friendly, age-ready society is an ageless society where everyone looks cool. And if you want to get out, but you can't get out but you do to physical limitations, whatnot. One of our colleagues that we've inspired is Rendever. I want you to imagine virtual reality where you can basically decide to go to Machu Picchu or go to the Paris Louvre, whatever it might be, virtual uh, travel. By the way, you may find this interesting. One of the number one places that older adults choose to go to, and especially if they're in assisted living, they want to see the street that they grew up in via Google Earth. And yes, as Mary Jane mentioned, we started the Longevity Hub with the Boston Globe. This is an idea, it's centered in Boston, around uh, MIT, and of course the Boston Globe. However, it is a New England-wide initiative. What we wanna to bring together are the thinkers, the innovators, the people that have the courage to say, we have something unique in New England to put out there to improve the lives of the people who live here, but to turn this into a market opportunity so that New England can export a vision, technology, services, policies, and the like to enable all of us to live longer and better. This touches on the obvious ones like biotech, but it also touches on transportation and education and housing. Every month we have a new edition of thinkers on what is happening in their little sector of the longevity economy. This past Monday in the Boston Globe, if you go online, you'll see there was a lead article a few months ago by myself and Lucio Quinto, another one earlier, and the one this week was on housing. What are the new thinking that we can provide on housing? The idea is to improve the quality of life of all of us here in the New England uh, region, and think about it. Three states to our north of Massachusetts, those of you in Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont, are three of the oldest states in the United States. Barnstable County is one of the oldest counties and on the Cape in the country. We want to take the insights of having companies and nonprofits and organizations and individuals get together to create a longevity hub, not just to create a market, not just to improve life here in the Commonwealth and in New England in general, we want to take this as an idea to export to an aging world. The world is aging. I believe we can lead on how to age well. So let's get into that. Look at these cute kids. Aren't they really cute? Well, they're cute because they're not teenagers yet. I want you to imagine this, that the data suggests that children born in the 1990s and 2000s, more than half of them in the so-called industrialized world, Europe, parts of Asia, North America, more than half of them are likely to live 100 years. I want you to think about what that might mean. Look at life expectancy, 100, 104, 107. Demography, they say, is destiny. 100 years changes almost everything. Think about the following. 100 years of a life. Do you believe that getting an education from someone that looks like me is going to last you 30, 40 years of work? Frankly, the speed of knowledge and changes in technology make a degree, probably half-life of a degree, end up at about 10 years, maybe 20 if you're lucky. You're going to be living in a world where school is never out. Will my wife of over 30 years of marriage want to hear me tell the same jokes over and over again? How many times will you move over a lifetime? How many times will you move in an older lifetime? 
And we should stop asking young people, what do you want to be when you grow up? Given the span of life, we should start preparing for a world where how many things will you be when you grow up? But here's another number I want you to think about. 2047. 2047 is the year where there will be more people on the planet over 60 than there will be people under age 18. Do you remember the economist Thomas Malthus? He was the, uh, one of the fathers of the pessimistic science. He was the one who said that the world does not have a carrying capacity for all these people. By the way, he was in the 1700s. And what Malthus forgot was technology, logistics, supply chain, better agriculture practices. And so far, we're okay. By the way, the UN, not known for its optimism and numbers, shows that the population is going to be going up, going up, going up, and by mid-century, start coming down the other way. You see, you need 2.1 children per female just to keep a population even. No country in the industrialized world is at replacement level with their own citizenry or their own residents. It is only through migration and immigration that some countries are growing and many are not. We'll come to those in a moment. And we're now even seeing in the developing world where fertility rate, birth rate rather, used to be at seven, 11 children per female, down to four, down to three. And some countries that you would never imagine running out of people are running out of people now. In fact, Denmark is one of my favorite examples, favorite stories, if you will. Someone actually paid research to find out that apparently Danes have more sex outside of Denmark than they do in the country. So wannabe grandparents created a whole advertising campaign for travel, having the ability to have buy vacations for their adult children to go to Paris, go to New York, go to London, but please come back with a souvenir. And look, you can look at the slides yourself or go on YouTube. The advertising campaign, you can't beat this slogan, was called Do It for Denmark. But don't worry, the Russians are crazy too. They have Make a Patriot Day. And if you can demonstrate that you made said patriot, you could get a refrigerator, a discount on an apartment, maybe even a pickup truck. Italy got in trouble with an Instagram campaign that was not too flattering for the recipients. But all countries are now looking at population change as a real challenge. In Germany, they're not just getting older. Nearly a third of their population is at retirement age. But, you know, you have to admire the Germans. When they see what they consider to be an issue, they come up with an innovation. They're coming up with an anti-aging beer. So at least we'll be aging well, so to speak, or with a smile. But here's something else we don't think about. It's not just about older nations. It's about some nations like the economic engine of Europe, the Germany, the bank of Europe, if you will, is emptying out. There are parts of Bavaria that are simply emptying out. And all of us know this is occurring here in Massachusetts and parts of the Berkshires. We know that Maine, for instance, is giving out-of-state tuition to international students and out-of-state, I'm sorry, in-state tuition to out-of-state students and international students because they're running out of students. We know that parts of Vermont are an empty quarter. By the way, it's not just there. In the Midwest, we are seeing the average American farmer at 61, where there are parts of towns that are just plain leaving. And China. Did any of us ever imagine where we would see China issuing a workforce shortage? The one child, one family policy issued in 1979 relaxed a number of years ago. So far, the answer is no. You see, they are below replacement level. Where imagine this, by mid-century, the entire population of the U.S., babies to older adults, will be roughly 400 million people. Guess what? There will be more than 400 million people in China over the age of 60. The median age of China and Europe and the United States are going to be radically different. Look at China and, and Europe. We're talking about an entire continent or an entire country in what we consider today to be midlife crisis. And this is the slide that always burns into the brain of the viewer. In Japan, you know, I could tell you all kinds of stats, but this one you'll remember. They are already today selling more adult diapers than they are selling child diapers. And their own government a year ago was very happy. They were ecstatic that their population was not going to crash as far as they thought. You see, they roughly have 127 million people today. But by mid-century, they're happy. They think it's only going to go down to 89 million, where maybe as many as 35 to 40 percent will be over the retirement age today leaving them with questions of who's going to buy the products, who's going to do the work, who's going to provide the care. 
And here in the United States, I've got to update this slide because the census numbers just came out about a week ago. But the fact of the matter is, is that one of you, and you know who you are, the baby boomers, they're called Dainkai in Japan, born between 1946 and 64, are turning 75 every seven to eight seconds. But we are aging unevenly across the country. There are parts that have the demographic profile of Japan and of Germany and parts of Europe overall. And then there are parts that are very, very young. The Midwest, the Rust Belt, New England, West Virginia, these are older areas. New, uh, Florida, Arizona, aging in part because of the residents, but also in part because of retirement migration. But if we're going to live that long, let's enjoy it. You know, this whole wellness thing about eating well and exercising, seeing your doctor, it's good advice. But just make sure that we don't make living longer feel that way for all the things that they ask us to do. So our friend here is saying, let's have a better life of living longer and better. I want you to notice something, though. This is not a story of more. As I write in my book, The Longevity Economy, old age is about a more older adults, but they're different. You know, the next generation of old and even the current generation now have more years of education than any group before. Now, look, I'm the first one to tell you that education alone does not make you smart, but it does give you, shall we say, chronic attitude. Should imagine this, some data suggests that more than half of the 65 plus year olds, if we want to use that as a demarcation line, have a, they believe they have an IQ above average. In fact, 74% of them have a great deal of confidence in themselves. This is a new population with a new attitude about what they can do, the information they seek, what they think of expertise, who they trust, who they don't. This is not your parents or grandparents old age, where they looked at institutions and credentials and had reverence. This is a group that in many cases will say, you know, brain surgery, maybe I'll get a brain surgery to do it, brain surgeon to do it, but I probably could go on YouTube and look up to see how it's done and then maybe think about maybe doing it myself. And as we saw during the pandemic, technology has been accelerated into people's lives. But even before that, the fastest growing group of people on, shall we say, Facebook, which has gotten the nickname now, a social media nursing home, Fastest growing group on that platform are now women over the age of 47 years old. This is why students, if you ever ask them, do you have a Facebook page? They run in horror because they're afraid. Why would you post what you did Friday night to have your grandmother see it on Saturday morning? So the digital divide is still there in part because broadband is not universal. In part because some of us have not learned to use the technology. In part, it's affordability. It's about the money, not just the uh, ease of use. But that division is closing, and it's closing faster than we ever imagined. More than half of the adults in the United States over 75 own a tablet. And by the way, do you know there's a whole new medical category called We Wrist and We Elbow? It is older adults playing with such verve and vigor video games and, and keeping score online and we bowling leagues and virtual leagues that they're blowing out ligaments, they're hurting muscles. There are senior centers outside of London that are playing these games frequently and quite often have to treat the people on site. And who's going to be the catalyst of the longevity economy? So guys, there's probably a lesson for all of you and myself, why I'm in the basement and why my wife is upstairs. As I write in my book, The Longevity Economy, chapter three, the future is female. Yes, old age primarily, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's the way it should be. I'm just telling you the way the numbers are. Women do most of the work. They provide most of the care. They're more likely to live longer and the like. But even in their younger years, they're the chief consumer officer of the home. Even though many men may be the breadwinner or maybe the first one to stand up at the financial advisor meeting or, or talk about what they're gonna be doing in retirement, why don't you look at these numbers? We're looking at nearly 89% of consumer electronics bought by women. 65% of automobiles directly influenced are purchased by women. Unless, of course, it's a luxury car. Then the numbers go up into the 80% tiles. How about home improvement? How many of us remember Lowe's and Home Depot and places like that that took great pride at having forklifts steaming down the aisle? Do you notice how they calmed that down? Because they found out that the guys that were driving business at Home Depot and Lowe's where the guys with the three quarter ton pickup trucks in the parking lot picking up what middle aged and older women were picking up and choosing in their store. And 80 cents and 90 cents on the dollar of every healthcare decision from the shaving cream that men use to the band-aids to the, the doctors we choose, the health insurers, to the medication that we take care, take are chosen by a woman in our life. 
In fact, I get a lot of rolling of the eyes when I say this, but I mean it. I have a lot of interest in middle-aged women in particular. Why is that? Well, in part, is because women typically between 47 and 57 years old are the second gr number of group of people to provide care after the spouse of a, of a loved one. The oldest adult daughter is the primary caregiver after the partner uh, themselves. But here's the thing. Millennials report that their most trusted advisor and friend is not another millennial, not their father, but rather their mother. We also know that this woman is pretty much managing the house. We also know that unless her partner or spouse, whatever, has an older adult sister, congratulations. She is now likely to have far more parents to care for than she had ever planned on having children. And guys, I'm sorry to tell you this, the highest divorce rate in the world is so-called gray divorce. In fact, some suggest that 90% of the divorces are initiated by, I can hear it through the ether, yes, by the woman. Why would you give up this big hunk of man? After all, it looks like he's a pet lover. Well, very interesting. Could have been a fun slide if I said it was about money, then we could have turned this into a retirement discussion. No, I'm not that. Could have been fun to talk about if it was sex. Could have been a very interesting slide. Nope, not that either. No, the number one reason is he bores me. This is where my wife usually asks me if I'm reading my own research. Have I upped my game, so to speak? But the bottom line is even the Canadians, who I thought were my nicer cousins up in Ontario in particular, where my, I have family, um, they actually report women up there say, no, he simply ran out of gas was the most popular answer. Uh, this fellow looks like he's got plenty of gas, but we'll let that go. But the bottom line, it's not just about numbers and education and tech savviness and whatnot. It's also about not evenly distributed, but it's also about the fact that the older population around the world is roughly the third largest economy in the world. The 60 plus have a buying power that is number three after the GDP of the US, China, and then the longevity economy. And in the United States, while the 50 plus year olds only garner two to 3% of advertising dollars, they do control nearly 68% of the buying power that's out there. So as much as I love millennials, I've got two of them my own, so to speak, and all my students and the like, they have numbers, but so far they don't have money. But again, these are not evenly distributed. Let's talk about coffee. I know it's late in the day for some of us. Let's talk about coffee though. Simple cup of coffee. How many of us are old enough to remember though, our parents telling us this was coffee? With all due respect to the folks at Sanka, to me, this is decaffeinated swill. I do not call it coffee. Here's what I want you to think about. We also know that at any age, this can be coffee as well. No, I'm not saying you need to buy a five to $10 cup of coffee and make it fancy. What I am telling you, however, is that everyone who's alive today is now realizing that everything can be personalized, everything can be special, and even something as simple as coffee can be made just for me. This is a changing. Remember, people judge their futures based upon the, the looking around at everything around them. Do we believe that the generation of old that are coming into their old age today, let alone those tomorrow, are going to be nearly as patient or as polite as the World War II generation or the earliest generation of silence? I don't think so. They're going to be, believe there's a pill, a product, a process, or something, an experience that's going to help them live longer and better. So I'm a big fan of Jimmy Buffett. And as the uh, uh, parrot head prophet might say, we are the people your parents warned you about. You see, the new generation gap is about expectations. Where previous generations of older adults believe that older, that there, uh, as we age, there might be less. The next generation has seen so much change in everything from the built environment to high schools and hospitals to shopping malls, to technologies and the like, that they believe that there's going to be something that's going to make their lives better. That gap between what our parents experienced and what we demand is the longevity economy. It's almost like an emerging market that's been hiding in plain sight, arising out of the abyss. You know, it's amazing how many investors go out of their way to look across the world in little nooks and crannies or specialized areas. 
when in fact the consumer that we know best, or frankly, we know they're here, but we know the least rather, is right in front of us. This is the longevity economy. This is the essence of why I believe a longevity hub here in New England is not just something that we aspire to, to improve the quality of life of people who live here, but also to be something that we can learn, develop, improve our quality of life, and then export that to the world. Let's talk about stories. I told you I'd come back to this. Stories as I see them are the most powerful technology in the world. Yeah, I said technology. Not necessarily space travel, the internet, the genome. Those are all amazing things that I have trouble even understanding. But I do understand stories. Stories, if you think about it, become so powerful, we don't even think about them after a while. They just go into our brain. They explain why we do certain things, why we don't do others why we did this and we don't do that, the range of possibilities, what's right, what's not right. And by the way, stories become so powerful, we don't ask questions after a while. We take stories more as law than Newton's law of gravity. But here's the thing, when it comes to stories, one of the biggest ones is about old age. And I've got news for you, old age is made up. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not making that up, but old age is. I want you to imagine the following, Old age, the way we think of it today, the way we lament quite often about old age, how we've constructed our public policies, how we use words and the like, came out of mid, middle 1800s medical science in the, in the United Kingdom and then exported to the United States and permeated everything from our stories to our beliefs, to our policies, and even our institutions. And here's the story. You'll recognize it and you may even be shocked. But the idea was, is that you were born, you were imbued, if you will, with a certain amount of vital force, vital energy. And if you used it badly, which by the way, meant anything fun, or you worked hard or whatever it is, you drained down that energy, that you became no longer a glass full of energy, you became glass half empty. In fact, what would happen when that energy would go away? You would become tired. And by the way, if you couldn't work in the 1800s, early 1900s, most of that labor was physical labor, what would happen? You'd better have good family and, ha and family that could support you. Because if you could not work because you were too tired, you had to go where? You had to go to alms homes, which by the way, turned into retirement homes. You see, you were so tired that you had to retire. And if you didn't have family to be able to support you, you went into alms homes, but those alms homes became retirement homes eventually. And retirement homes in many cases were converted into nursing homes. And for those of us from the North Country, we're used to the phrase funeral homes. Isn't it amazing how there's a nice linear line based upon this story of old age and how it permeates everything? We thought of a certain age when people were too tired to work on the train lines or building or assembly lines or manufacturing. And that's how we started to determine well, retirement should be 55, 60, 62, 65. These were all numbers and policies built on a story more than a century old. This is why I suggest to you that the greatest achievement of humankind has been living longer, 30, 40 years of a longevity dividend compared to life expectancy in 1900, a mere 46 or 47. We've turned into the problem, we've turned 30 or 40 years of added life into a problem to be solved rather than an achievement and an opportunity to be realized. Like Malthus, we refuse to change the fact that the assumptions underlying what we believe have fundamentally changed. And stories have consequences. Great businesses like Heinz with money and researchers and whatnot never question the story that apparently older adults, not only do they not have teeth, apparently they don't have taste either. So they created Heinz Senior Foods. Well, needless to say, Many older adults have teeth, and most of us have taste, and needless to say, that product crashed and burned. Probably the only one to show real imagination in the past century was, was Del Webb. He looked at the population that was coming out of World War II, and he said, these folks are going to be retiring soon, or they were already were retiring. They had pensions, they, they had time, they, they were healthy. What do they do? What story could we write? I know. They can play. They can have leisure. They can golf. They can walk beaches. They can. A life of leisure is what is deserved after a lifetime of work. That's not incorrect, but we have to write a new narrative. 
I would suggest that leisure alone is woefully incomplete. But it was a vision. It's probably the only vision we've had since the vital force vision of you're tired, it's time for you to retire. How about the devices that we have out there? Imagine this, a survey sh uh, showed that only 35% of 75 year olds believe that they're old. 100% of people who have devices on their wrists and on their jackets and belts and purses know that they're old. Personal emergency response systems are profoundly rational, necessary, save lives every day. But only 4%, roughly, of the frail 65 plus actually adopt them. In the UK, where they are free on doctor's orders from the National Health Service, it only goes up to 11 to 12%. You see, products are not just what they do for us, they're about what they say about us as well. Senior housing long before the pandemic is now getting questions as to do people, the next generation of old, want to live there? We don't know whether this is a remote control or a self-defense device. I'll call the, you have to call it what it is. It is engineering and designer laziness. We should be able to design, if you will, for all ages to be able to use and to be proud that they have it. Think about it. It is the only industry in the world, technology that is, where it can blame the consumer for not being able to use the product. That's, that's some degree of arrogance and just poor design. And I don't know if you know this, but after about 50 or 60, the only thing that you're gonna be doing is managing your medications and your blood pressure. That's it. I'm only kidding because so many of the innovations and apps and services and devices and the internet of things are aimed at our health. Why? Because the old age story is old age is about being tired and sick. Yes, that's true for many. Not true for all. And even the sick won't have the things to do. What is this color? No, you're not colorblind. It's kind of a yucky gray. How about this color? I call this clinical blue. Think about the fact that whenever we see things being made for older adults, they tend to be big, often beige, but always boring. Who wants these devices in their living room, even in their bedroom, whatever it might be? The longevity economy is about creating new products, services, and experiences that excite and delight, and not just support. Let me tell you a quick story. 8,000 days. This should get your attention. Many of you are living it now. From zero to 21 years old, and if it makes it easier for some of you, drinking age, from birth to drinking age is about 8,000 days. From 21 years old to midlife crisis, 46, 47, be generous with the numbers, is about 8,000 days. And from midlife crisis to that law of physics of retirement, 65, it's about 8,000 days. I bet you're getting the algorithm now. More than 52% of us, if you make it to 65, will make it to 85 and change. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That's another 8,000 days. So let's take zero to 21 years old and move that off to the side. We'll call it childhood, early adulthood, whatever we want to call it. You are no longer looking at retirement as a short trip to Disney, some visits with the grandchildren, a, a cruise, and, and, and unfortunate some illness and some caregiving. No, you are now looking at what we call today retirement as one third of your adult life. This is a period to be reinvented. Because think, think about it, there are very few rituals, myths, and stories and whatnot once you hit 65. Yes, you pay for other people's parties. Yes, there's a retirement party. Maybe if you hit a big birthday, they give you a special card in a party. But we run out of, shall we say, stages of life. All the others were made up. It's time for us to make up new ones for this stage of life as well. A time to be celebrated, not lamented. And that time includes at least four different periods of life. You know, retirement's not just this one span. The first part of it could be you know, managing ambiguity. We don't know whether we're working or volunteering, going to school. Those of you that are members of the Ali community, you're still vibrant and, vibrant and full of verve. And then there's the, you know, the next step is that managing big decisions. I'm showing my age when I reference the group. Remember the group, The Clash? Should I stay or should I go? Do I finally stop work? Do I downsize? Do we move from this home or this apartment? Where do we go? One of the other lies around retirement is that it's a time to take it easy. It's all so simple. Just relax. No, not really. Administration of finances, understanding healthcare, caregiving, managing medications, nutrition. Is the place we're living in now able to support the what we need? No, there's some serious decisions. And then ultimately, 
if you're part of a couple, one of you sadly will be living solo. How do you set that up? What are the services you will need, the technologies you will need, the social supports as well? So working in retirement, 35% of the population says that they plan to work until they drop. Even in Canada, we're looking at 15 to 20% of the population saying, yeah, working until they drop. Not just because of money. That's the number one reason. But the other is meaning and having a reason to get up in the morning. We're seeing that during COVID and, and the like that all of a sudden for many of us that are in the knowledge economy, working from my basement seems to be possible. I might not want to do it day after day after day, but that newfound flexibility may convince many that they go, no, oh, you know, I would have retired earlier, but now I don't have to fight traffic every single day. School's never out. The fact that I'm speaking to all of you, the idea, why is it that school and learning still seems to be defined for only the young, when in fact changes in technology, doubling of knowledge in almost every profession demands that we all stay on top of our game, online, in class, wherever it may be found. Ill but not sick. You know, I get a kick out of a lot of the health economists that look at the chronic conditions of older adults, and they talk about how ill we are all. Well, in part, that's true. But being ill is not the same as being sick. You may have one, two, three chronic conditions. You may be asthmatic, diabetic, and hypertensive. Are you managing it well? Are you taking your medication? Are you doing the things you need to do? So you can walk the dog, volunteer, go to class, work part-time. You're technically ill, and that's how it gets recorded on the, in the health uh, uh, data, but you're not necessarily sick. And so the technologies that we've seen since the pandemic and before, telemedicine, which has been around, believe it or not, as a concept since the late 1890s, believe it or not, is now making a checkup a day, maybe something that we can do, or at least a check-in. Your home is getting smarter, your refrigerator now in my case, is going to be able to detect that I'm out of my favorite, my two favorite advisors, Ben and Jerry, and have foods delivered to me in real time. Maybe advise me on my medications or tell me what I need to eat for proper nutrition. We're now seeing devices that are already on the market that are not only engaging with us socially, but reminding us to take our meds, but also reminding us of our favorite recipe. How about where you're living in retirement? 70% of us over age 50 in the United States and Canada live in rural and suburban areas. That has all kinds of challenges and all kinds of opportunities around it. Even that small percent that downsize are choosing to go to college communities in smaller towns. The vast majority of us wish to stay where we are to age in place. Where our marriage, our mortgage, and our memories are, that's where we would like to be. And unfortunately, only half of us believe we can. I know that we're very proud of Age Friendly. The World Health Organization and, and ARP have been doing a brilliant job of making Age Friendly something we should reach for. Absolutely, keep doing it, it's important. I don't like the language though. I want communities that are age ready. If you've lived in a community and you've paid your taxes, you've made your contribution, I want a community that's not doing it because it's polite or that it's friendly or we're just being courteous to the older citizenry, no. I want a community that's ready for me from birth to death. And by the way, that community will be seamless, safe, have the intensity, accessibility to make everyone's lives something that they are excited and have desire to live in that place. If we can make it better for the old, we make it better for the all. Who's gonna change your light bulbs? Do you ever think of that question? Sounds like a silly question. One of my light bulbs, just as I was speaking, went out. So I'm gonna have a job after I'm done talking. But all those little things that you do, you take for granted in your home, have you planned for that? That's part of the longevity planning. Even if you have your health and your wealth, do you have the services that you may need to remain independent from cleaning the house, taking out the trash, changing the light bulbs, preparing a meal? Who will you trust to go into your mother's home when she's old, frail, and alone? Who will you trust to come into your home when you may be older, frailer, and maybe alone? My favorite question, most important food group, ice cream. How will you get an ice cream cone? This is particularly relevant for rural America in, uh, in general, but also, frankly, even the urbanites don't have a lock on this. So it's not just about the ice cream, it's the following. First off, do you know the little things that make you smile in older age? You know, we often go through this, what do we wanna do in older age? What are your objectives? And that's all great and that's, that's perfect. But what are the little things you do every day that's a personal ritual that maybe even your partner does not even know about? Is, you know, you know, a blueberry muffin and a cup of coffee at your favorite place. So first question is, do you know what you like? But here's the other one. I want you to imagine it's a hot summer night, a hot summer night in the Berkshires, and you suddenly want 
a soft serve ice cream on a wafer cone. In my case, I want it chocolate. Here's a question for you. Do you have transportation to get there? At a split moment, no one calls a van or a transit company up or age or the uh, older adult services area a week in advance, two weeks in advance saying, you know, I plan to have an ice cream cone on Tuesday night at seven o'clock when I hear the peepers out and it's about 78 degrees. I want to get ice cream. No, that doesn't happen. We often don't want to bother our adult children. But do you have a way to get there? If you do not drive in the United States, the very glue that holds big and little things we call life together, you're stuck. The number two way of getting around is riding with someone who does drive. So transportation, believe it or not, is the second cost in retirement. And yet it's almost totally ignored. And the driverless car is coming, but don't hold your breath. It's going to be coming, but it's going to be coming slowly. We are going to be relying on networks, faith-based institutions, family, friends, and the like. This is where rural America and small town America shines. There is more social capital, which is fancy for saying we know our neighbors, we try to help them out more than often in many urban areas. And in urban areas, we have crises too. Just because something is accessible by law does not mean that it is easy and seamless for the rest of us to be able to read the signs, go through crowds and the like. Coming to the end here, who are you gonna have lunch with? I had to get a bear in here after all. The fact is, since we're gonna be talking to many of you that are in, in rural areas, very important question. The true social security is not the check written to you from the folks in Washington, DC. True social security is about your social capital. The fancy phrase that we now use to, we used to say friends. And I don't mean just friends that you count online and how many likes you get from some silly photo. I'm talking about the friends you can depend on, the ones that you can have lunch with at the blink of an eye, the ones that will help you out when something happens, the ones that will take you to the hospital should be necessary or to a doctor's appointment, the real friends. As we age, that natural social capital tends to decline. We have to save and build our social capital up, our true longevity capital, as much as we think about our health and our wealth. In fact, we know from the research out there that has been done by many that the idea of being socially isolated and lonely is the physical health equivalent of smoking 11 to 15 cigarettes per day. We know that it's not just a rural problem. We know that it's a suburban problem. And just because you live in a high rise in the city does not necessarily mean that you know your neighbors or choose to talk to the person in the elevator nearby. In fact, in the UK, they even have a minister of loneliness showing that this is not just a US phenomenon. We've created technologies of high tech to create video game networks, as well as ways of talking on Zoom and the like. High tech is out there. Whether it changes is better than high touch, we'll talk about in a second. We have all kinds of robots now to help us remind us to take our meds, tell us jokes, even one that is for $20,000, imagine that, that will insult you twice a day because the, the, the researchers believe that telling jokes and insulting you will keep you cognitively sharp. I don't know about you, but I've got two kids. They insult me free every day, so I don't need to buy a robot for that. And lastly, who's going to provide care? Care for your loved ones, care for you, whatever it might be. We know that the number one caregiver is your partner, your spouse. And after that, it typically is the oldest adult child, who typically, as I mentioned, is the oldest adult daughter. And by the way, she spends upwards of 26 to 29 hours a week. But by the way, my last ask, by the way, I want to look at all of you and I'm asking you the following. If you think you're going to be a caregiver, if you are a family or friend caregiver, or if you were, I want to hear from you. My team needs to hear from you. We have a global study going on with the largest platform of family care, friends, caregivers around the world to understand the big and little things you do every day. So please, Send an email to agelabinfo at mit.edu if you're one of those folks. And every month or two, we will send you a survey or invite you to a focus group or ask you to participate in something. And you don't have to, it's free. You might even get an Amazon gift card out of it. But I wanna hear from real people providing the real body of work that is in aging. And that's about caregiving. And we're gonna see this only grow. We've had fewer children. Our children have moved. They've gotten busy. We don't want to ask. Many of us are double income, no kids. Many of us are still single and have no one. The Japanese are building robots because they don't have people to provide care and they're getting older out there. Some of this technology is between cool and creepy. In fact, I gave you some of the cool. Here's the creepy. My favorite piece of technology, the smart toilet. Toto and Panasonic and others have developed a technology that will download from the user, since we're approaching dinner for many of us, 
that did you take your medication? Did you eat well, download your body weight, maybe even your urine content uh, and, and is your blood pressure as well? And then upload those data to a call center, nutrition, whatever it might be. All of a sudden now your toilet is talking to your toaster, your refrigerator is talking to the grocery store. In fact, there's actually a pilot program that was done with smart toilets where your toilet was facilitating home delivery of the foods it deems that were missing from your diet. Yeah, your house is getting smarter. It's also getting a little creepier. Let me end on a few questions for you to ponder. High tech, as much as I love it, and will help us live longer and better. High tech is still no substitute for high touch. We've learned during the pandemic that a friendly face on Zoom is not the same as one at your door. A wave on virtual is not the same as a hug in person. We have to think about the life that we want to create. Old age is a story was made up. I'm inviting all of you in your own way to help me rewrite a new story of old age, one that is accessible to all, one that is affordable to all, and one that is acceptable to all. Let me end on the following story that's one of my favorites. In Europe, as a kind of a part-time fan of arch uh, architectural history, they were building cathedrals like crazy in the 1100s, 1200s, 1300s, and they were huge. And they didn't have the population to have that big a church, if you will. And when you look at the research that was done on why they were building these cathedrals, it was because they wanted not just to do it because of the faithful. They wanted to see how far could they push their architects, their mathematicians, their budding engineers, their construction acumen. They wanted to rise to the heavens to see how far they could push. I'm inviting all of you to do the same. Let's build a new cathedral of what longevity can be like. Let's build a new vision, a new story of old age where all of us are wedded together in a social contract from zero to the end to live longer and better. I wanna thank the folks in the Berkshires and Ali and all of you for inviting me. I'll find you on social media. I hope you enjoy my book. And I, if we have time, I'd love to have a few questions too. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coughlin. That was great. Um, and uh, people like your energy. There have been a number of comments in the chat on that. Um, there have also been um, a number of questions. Um, so we'll start with one, and that is um, how come you're focusing on people 85 and older in, oh. um, with your longevity leadership group? Uh, that's only for the lifestyle leader group, and we're focusing in on the 85 plus, because as we say in gerontology, that is the oldest old and is the fastest growing part of the population worldwide, and it is also the least understood. But in the age lab, now this is going to make some people uh, uh, be, uh, shrug their shoulders. It sounded good when I was younger, not so good now. We define old age in the lab as 45 and older. So all our research starts from, frankly, from 18 year olds going forward, but we look at old age beginning at 45 because that's when your first checkup, your doctor says, gee, you're okay, but you might wanna watch a few of these things. You're calling your parents, hoping that they're saying they're, they're able to answer the phone and doing better than you hope. And third, that's the time when I'm gonna be able to get things into your life and your home that will be cool today and provide you care tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Um... There's um, another question here. Um, there, there are actually a number of questions related to housing. Um, so uh, one question is, what are you doing at the Age Lab uh, that relates to supporting the 50% of people who won't be able to afford assisted living? Yeah. How that, since that was a model in the past, um, what's the new way of thinking about that model? You know, it was a model, but even if we added up everybody who goes into a continuing care retirement community or uh, assisted living, whatever, that was always under, well under 10% of the population. We're trying to come up with it, new tools, technologies, and services that will enable you to stay where you love, where your marriage, your mortgage, and your memories are in your home. Now, there may be some that will need that care, and we're working with others. And we've got colleagues here in town, one of my former students uh, called Two Life. And if you get the most recent uh, Boston Globe, uh, they have an article in there, Amy Schechtman and, uh, and Elise Sellinger wrote, um, 
so we're, we're working with them. But bottom line is we're working to try to find a way for you to be stay in your home for as long as possible. Okay, thank you. And I think that's related to another question, which is um, here in the Berkshires, we have a villages of the Berkshires with a second one about to come online. Um, uh, what do you think about this villages model of um, seniors and self-help um, uh, as, as a way to address um, staying, staying at, living at home? successfully. I, I see countless innovations out there to remind you to take your meds. I've even seen, you know, some of you will get a kick out of this. I've seen countless students come up with, with walkers that have got GPS uh, designed into them. The village movement from my colleagues across the bridge at Beacon Hill Village, I believe is one of the greatest innovations in aging in decades. That along with the PACE program and the like are some of the true ideas of how we can come together uh, as community, as policy and, and the like. So the bottom line is, I think it's a great thing. And every one of them is different because every community is different. Okay, so for all of you here who um, are on, uh, if you're in the Berkshires, uh, you can uh, Google Villages of the Berkshires and um, that's an organization that's in partnership with Ali. Um, so Ali at BCC, so please uh, check that out. So thank you. Um, uh, there's, uh, let, uh, sorry, um, has, as you've been doing this research, um, we know that there was um, research done um, that talks about blue zones. So uh, areas where people live longer, healthy, exceptionally longer, healthier lives compared to the rest of the population. Have you incorporated that information from the blue zones or do you do any cooperative work um, as, as you think about what's happening at the Age Lab? I think the author of the Blue Zones, Dan Butner, and the work he's done is quite amazing. Uh, he and I have done some tag teams and, and the like. We're actually looking at what are some of the metrics that one can use to measure what well-being is in many of these areas. Now, that said, I think there are insights from the Blue Zones that we can tease out and make applicable to various communities. So, you know, with a great deal of pride, I have to uh, tell everyone, my wife is of Greek descent and her family is from Greece, her parents from Greece. And one of the blue zones uh, in Ikaria uh, enables people apparently to live well past 100 years old and continue working and the like. I always tease my family as well as I tease Dan Butner, the author, which is, look, if my commute was only crossing the street and traffic was only the goats, I probably live a long time too. So we have to tease out what we can and apply it to the communities as they are, not necessarily as we would like. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, uh, there's um, another question related to affordability. And that is, um, there's a, a participant today said that she was remodeling her home and wanted to buy some smart appliances but discovered that they were so expensive and that the safeguards weren't as safe as she thought they would be, that she ended up going with older style appliances. Um, so can you speak to both the issue of cost and the issue of safety um, with um, appliances and whether that's being hacked or having your Alexa you know, turn your heat up too much or something, so. <laughs> no, I, I wrote an article uh, with my colleague, Lucio Quinto years ago uh, called Grandma Got Hacked. Uh, it is interesting how uh, older adults today are likely to be the uh, leading edge of new ways of living that many younger people would reject out of hand. Uh, so having your house watch you, your toilet monitor you and things like that. Uh, so that, that's going to be an issue around privacy and dignity and, and the like that has to be addressed, uh, both on a policy level and a personal level. With respect to affordability, I can hear my father's voice ringing in my head decades ago, you know, and I'd say, in the end, these things will become cheaper. My father used to say, yeah, in the end, we're all dead. But here's the thing. 
I was one of those crazy people who bought the very first personal computer in the mid 80s for $5,000. That's more money than it is today in the mid 80s. Had twin floppy drives, four to seven hertz. I was going big time. Today, there's more power in my phone than the entire Apollo space program. So it's getting cheaper. Please be patient. But one of the things I would suggest we think about is how government, not necessarily buy it for us, but we're seeing examples around the world where government is subsidizing home affordable homes and whatnot to be almost more intelligent than those of us living in private homes. That kind of mass purchasing will bring the price points down for the rest of us. Okay, uh, thank you. And that relates to, there is a question here about what you think the role of government is in helping people to age in place. So the role, let's put it this way, the aging of the global population, so-called uh, uh, demographic transition, where there become more older people than younger people, is far too big for industry alone. It is far too big for the nonprofit sector. It is also far too big for government. The biggest innovation that we, I hope to have come out of the pandemic was creative ways to create partnerships to develop, deliver services and products and experiences. And so role of government is one of facilitator, agenda setter. And by the way, the role of government is also to set the agenda to ensure that everyone gets the attention, not just those that have the money and the knowledge. That's the definition of access. It's not just about use, but government also needs to put up on the agenda people that are in, in areas where there may not be broadband, people of color, culture, and lower education and income who may not be able to access those utilities that have now become critical to quality of life, not a great life, but just basic quality of life. So no, government has a role, but all parts of society have a role because this is big. This is the biggest thing happening on the planet. That is a sure bet. Demography is destiny. Okay, and um, there's um, what what can we do when government is um, not um, is not responding to things that seem pretty obvious. Um, so for example, there was a, a comment about um, uh, get to know an audiologist before you're not able to hear. Um, and the fact that Medicare doesn't cover uh, audiology services or hearing aids. So uh, what, how do you see this disconnect um, as you're thinking about a new story of aging um, between the, the story as it is today, which doesn't meet the needs of those of us who are aging, um, and how can we get government up to speed um, with, uh, with the news stories? I, I'm not entirely sure how many people are gonna click off when they hear my answer, they may not like it. Um, the bottom line is, is that my parents' generation and before them were too nice. They were too polite. The way to get that attention is to make noise. You know, Jimmy Buffett's got a line called quietly making noise. Don't be so quiet. Think about telemedicine. It has been around since the 1890s. They were looking at it from a government perspective in the 1950s. We, it took an entire global pandemic to have people even know that it exists and now found that it was better than going into a waiting room to read three month old people magazines. No, we need to make noise because all the things that will help older adults will also help people that are bringing kids into the doctor's office and those of us managing chronic conditions in middle age. No, if we don't like policy, it's not that they're not listening, they're just not hearing you. Make yourself heard. Okay, and for those of you who are on, this is a comment. Um, since I've been on all four of our talks, uh, every one of our speakers has said, make noise, <laughs> has said, create a movement around aging in your community. Um, there's another question here that related to your um, um, your slide about being ill but not sick. Um, how can we deal with the way in which society is medicalizing old age uh, or 
um, longevity and is medicalizing what is a perfectly natural process and turning it into being sick. Yeah, and that stems right out of the story of old age, that, that, that medical literature around vital force, vital energy from the 1800s still permeates the mind. You can even hear it in the language as we look at our, our leadership in, in Washington or around the world as there is, is someone, are they more frail? We're like looking for confirmation of our bias as to what old age is. And so one of the problems we have is the way we count disease. Just because you have that condition, does not necessarily mean that you are a burden on your family or anyone else as long as it's well managed. And by the way, that chronic condition seems to be going down in older age. Uh, by the way, just I, I did see a, a, a question flash by uh, that I did want to address. Telemedicine was I identified as an idea, I believe it was about 1895 in the journal The Lancet, when this crazy thing called the telephone was coming to be. And then what they were surmising was, could we imagine using this, this thing called the telephone to maybe better manage heart patients? And so here we are more than 120 years later and we're still going, wow, that's amazing technology. It took a pandemic to move us into the 1890s. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, and that was one of the questions. Um, and, um, there's been a lot of discussion, and I'd be interested in this um, a comment here, but um, we know that insurance companies have covered uh, telemedicine appointments uh, during the pandemic, but there are comments about the fact that that may be rolled back. Um, what do you think can be done uh, to encourage um, the continuation and the improvement of, um, of telemedicine um, once the pandemic uh, has passed. I think for those of us that are still employed, we need to do, uh, put pressure on our employers that when they negotiate those uh, health insurance contracts that telemedicine remains a part. For those of you that have gap coverage, you make noise to demand that it remains a part. And for those of you that are reliant on government, we demand to make it. What, what kind of society would say we have a solution, but we don't want to use it? In fact, we know that doctors can provide more coverage, often cheaper and faster using digital health. Now, there are times when we need to be in person to have that touch. But for simple checkups, an incredible number of technologies that are doing blood pressure, oxygen rates, and the like that you can do digitally, what, what, what logic would there be to stepping back? It's not, it's not acceptable is the bottom line. And that's what we need to voice to our insurers, our employers, and to our feds. Okay, thank you. Um, another uh, couple of questions. Um, you talked about some new devices and one of our listeners said that she has been providing care for people who have disabilities and especially people who are living with ALS. Um, how can the kinds of devices that you're developing at the age lab uh, be helpful, not just for healthy seniors or seniors, but also for younger people uh, in the disability community? Yeah. Well, first off, you know, any of the technology we do in the lab, we try to make ageless because I'm a firm believer that if I make, and this is going to be somewhat uh, disheartening to some, but if I make a technology uh, or a town or a product or a service just for the old, I can guarantee the following. We learned this in the auto industry, that if I make an old man's car, I can guarantee that a young man and a young woman won't buy it. But I can also guarantee that an old man and an old woman won't buy it as well. So we try to make those technologies so that they're ageless. With respect to the disabilities community, the greatest challenge is these technologies can help those that are disabled and those who are providing care for the disabled community. The biggest challenge is less the technology, then there's no one place to find out where these things exist, how to install them, how to maintain them, how to troubleshoot them when they do uh, break, and they will. Um, that, that is an amazing opportunity and demand that we have, not just for the disabled community and their families, but for everyone across every age group. Okay, so business opportunity for people who can help keep technologies going. Yep. Okay, uh, and uh, you've talked quite a bit about geography here. Um, how 
important is geography with regard to aging? And you've talked about smaller communities sometimes having that touch, that being known. Um, to be honest, when my husband and I retired, we were living in Washington, DC, and we said, we don't wanna be in a big city. Mm -hmm. We want to be in a community that has great culture, great outdoors stuff, but in a community where we can get to know people more easily than in a major city. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages and how are you trying to address those okay. uh, in different geographies? I, I would say aging is like real estate, location, location, location. Um, largely choosing places that have, and it sounds like you did as well, choosing those places that 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 have a certain degree of not just accessibility, but it, you know, I teach an urban planning course on, on global aging and the built environment that have the intensity of just enough things to keep you excited. You know, DC is, you know, I consider to be my my second home, but uh, you know, do I go to all those museums when I'm there? No, it was nice to have the choice, but maybe moving to a smaller town where there's maybe only one museum a drive away or nearby, or there's a, a park where there's a band there in the summer, those might might be enough. But you need to think about the following. Is there transportation that if you cannot drive or don't feel comfortable to drive, that can get you not just to what you need, but where you want to go when you want to be there? Are there services that you will need that are easily accessible? Can you get medical care, not the emergency service, but those that are the services that are around the chronic conditions that you're managing. Medicine has gotten so hyper-specialized, all doctors don't fit all conditions. So those are some of the first things I'd look at. And then the last thing to think about, I usually like to do threes, but I'll throw a fourth in there. That's probably the most important one, is the social connection. When you go to move to that small town, did you spend enough time there before you put your paper down to live there to make friends, to have activities, to have a reason to get up in the morning? That's how I would assess communities. I can tell you, I knew about Ollie before we moved here. It was one of the main things on our list was, is there a community of people who are involved with education and who are providing educational opportunities for older adults? So um, that was practically number one on my list. Um, so I think we're, um, I'm just gonna check my list here, sorry. Um, there were so many comments and questions. Well, I'll um, buy a little bit of time while you're looking at the list. One of the number one places to downsize uh, for that small percentage, and it's under 9% that, that leave their family home. Uh, for those who downsize, yes, there are still those going to the beach and some going to a golf course for those who can afford it. But the other place, college communities. Even places like Ann Arbor, where the weather's not exactly a big attraction, but those are places that there's things to do, people that are interesting, um, and, and just a, a general vibe that makes it worth the trouble. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, so another question uh, here has to do with those last 8,000 days. Uh, so the uh, were the projections that were made uh, around 2007 with regard to longevity, um, birth rates, et cetera, are those holding up? And is that 8,000 days staying sort of confident or, uh, or staying sort of constant or do we see that going up or down because of social determinants of health? I know in the UK, it's actually going down. Yeah, and in fact, the uh, we're seeing a, a little bit of a problem with the numbers in the United States as well. However, that's on the averages. So let's get into the numbers. The folks that are, shall we say, and it's a terrible way to put it, that are hurting the longevity numbers tend to be, at least in the United States, middle-aged white males with opioid and alcohol addiction in rural areas. That is really starting to depress the numbers where these poor folks due to suicide, overdosing and the like are really hurting the longevity numbers. We pull that out, we see longevity still going up. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's really good. So I'm getting a message from Megan that we need to wrap up. Uh, so for those of you um, who have enjoyed this talk and there are so many great comments uh, for you, Dr. Coughlin, um, <laughs> Number one, you will get a link to the recording, so you can go back and look at it again. Number two, 
uh, in that uh, message, uh, you'll be able to follow up uh, with the, um, the groups like the caregiver group, uh, the care hive, uh, and uh, the 85 and older group. Um, also, uh, if you are not an OLLI member, but you've liked this presentation, uh, please consider joining your OLLI wherever you are, because we're, people are here from all over the country. Uh, and um, we'll encourage you to uh, stay on this um, uh, theme. Um, we started almost two years ago now uh, with our uh, University Day on Changing the Culture of Aging. Uh, we have the shared interest group uh, here at our OLLI that uh, put this series together. If you're interested in joining that group, please reach out to the OLLI office and you can get in touch uh, with them. Uh, but uh, that's one way of making noise on this topic. Uh, so. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, Dr. Coughlin, uh, we hope that we will see you either in person or virtually again uh, in uh, the Berkshires. And we're looking forward to following what is happening with the Longevity Hub. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you, everybody.